Harvard Divinity School. The Truth Shall Set Whom Free, a conversation on esoteric knowledge, alternative spirituality, and conspiracy theories, December 8th, 2021. Good afternoon and welcome to our last Gnosiologies event for the semester. My name is Giovanna Parmigiani and I'm the host of the series organized within the Transcendence and Transformation Initiative at the CSWR here at Harvard Divinity School. This series focuses on ways of knowing that are often labeled as non-rational, traditionally referred to as gnosis in Western philosophical and religious traditions, and often understood in contraposition to science, these ways of knowing are becoming more and more influential in contemporary societies, popular culture, and academic research. So it is with immense pleasure then that I introduce our guest, Professor Egil Asprem, for today's conversation on esoteric knowledge, alternative spirituality, and conspiracy theories. Egil Asprem is professor of the history of religions at Stockholm University in Sweden, and a specialist in the study of esotericism. He has published widely on topics such as the European ritual magical traditions, the relationships between occult, occultism and the natural sciences, and religion and conspiracy theories. Some of his recent publications include New Approaches to the Study of Esotericism, a volume edited with Julian Struba, Handbook of Conspiracy Theory and Contemporary Religion with Asbjorn Direndal and David G. Robertson, and the article, The Magical Theory of Politics. Thank you, Ego, for being here. My students and I are fans of your work and are looking forward to this conversation today. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Giovanna. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Very well. So since this series is for a wider audience, shall we start from the basics? So what is esotericism and what's the role of knowledge in esotericism or gnosis? Yeah, sure, we can try. I mean, it's kind of the million dollar question. What is esotericism actually? Uh, because esotericism is a lot of different things. Um, but one thing that it is, is a, a, a category, an umbrella term more or less, that scholars use to talk about various, um, you could say alternative religious, spiritual, philosophical currents, pretty much the kind of things that I think you referred to in your introduction of the series actually, right? Things that, occurrence that are hard to um, classify in terms of the way that we look at uh, religion and science today. So they seem to clash with our understandings of institutionalized Christianity, for example, and, and science, natural science, sort of fall in between these uh, chairs. Um, so in that sense, of course, they have a lot to do with knowledge um, in the sense that um, there's often a focus on special ways of attaining knowledge um, that's central in it. Um, some people talk about the dynamic of the hidden and the revealed as being central to it. Um, which uh, can also go back to the uh, origins of the term, actually. So I think maybe I would like to say something about that, too, because one thing that esotericism is uh, also, uh, and maybe most fundamentally, is, of course, a word. <laughs> it's a word uh, with a history, and that history can tell us something about, well, how it has been used, how that has shaped uh, the understandings of what we mean by esotericism today, and also what people who claim to be doing esotericism uh, mean by it. Um, and so one thing to mention to begin with, I guess, is that uh, so the, the noun esotericism goes back to the adjective esoteric and the adjective esoteric uh, from the Greek, where we have it already in antiquity, esoterikos, um, is a very, has a very old history um, and it's part of a pair of terms, so the esoteric and the exoteric. And uh, basically, ordinary dictionary definitions of the esoteric and the exoteric today are pretty close at the original meanings, namely uh, signifying something that pertains to the inside uh, versus that which is on the outside, which would be an exoteric. And um, so uh, in antiquity already you had this, uh, particularly in the context of knowledge, uh, that esoteric knowledge is knowledge that is restricted for a small group. Uh, so what we should think about here is uh, primarily um, knowledge that is uh, transmitted orally to students in a teaching context so that uh, philosophers might write uh, dialogues for a broader public, uh, which would be the exoteric works, but it would also have teachings uh, for their uh, pupils, their students, which would be the esoteric um, uh, meanings of this. Uh, but what you see already in late antiquity is that this um, term esoteric and its contrast exoteric starts to be connected not only to a teaching situation, but also to 
uh, things like the uh, the mysteries, the mystery cults. Um, so uh, initiation becomes an example of uh, the esoteric and the transmission of esoteric knowledge. Um, and you also get by uh, by the time time of early Christianity and some of the early um, uh, the early church fathers like uh, Clemens of Alexandria, for example, a connection to religion. That um, so okay, so the the founders of the mystery cults were philosophers that were veiling the truths in myths, and you had to be initiated to learn how to interpret them. Uh, but also that Christianity had such an esoteric oral tradition that's um, kind of helping people to read the gospels the right way. And so these connections between the hidden uh, and revealed in terms of uh, knowledge that has to do with religion, philosophy, and initiation is pretty old stuff, and is at the center of some of the later um, uh, well meanings of esotericism as well. But um, this is a crucial point that the the noun esotericism then is a much much later uh, vintage. Uh, it's basically a term that you start getting in the 19th century. Well. You get it in German in the late seven, late seventeen uh, hundreds, and then in French in the early eighteen hundreds, and then it uh, comes into English as well. Um, and what's interesting to mention here is that um, one group that um, really started uh, picking up this term and running with it was uh, the people that we would now call occultists. Um, so it was very much an, an emic term in this uh, period, so uh, an in-group uh, term for uh, the kind of um, uh, lineage or transmission of secret knowledge that uh, one would claim to be holding today. So in the context of a 19th century occultism, esotericism would uh, reference uh, what kind of um, well, secret teachings of magic, uh, ancient wisdom from, uh, from, uh, from Egypt uh, or from uh, Zoroaster. Um, it would stand for the occult sciences, so alchemy and astrology uh, and so on. Um, but also like the Gnostics and uh, the Hermetists and uh, the Rosicrucians and the Knights Templars and, uh, you know, all you can think of um, forming a transmission to today, right? Um, that was the idea. So uh, what's, what's kind of um, important, the, the point I will get to here is that um, what we see then in the 19th century is that esotericism is part of an invented tradition inventing a tradition of uh, an alternative form of a secret current of uh, Western religion, right? Um, or perhaps also more globally, uh, because some of these uh, occultists would say that this is a perennial kind of wisdom that you can find in many different traditions. And uh, what's important about this is that um, when scholars have been trying to, uh, well, pick up, you know, build, build a, a field of research around esotericism, uh, the scope of these well related currents, you know, as I said, it's, it's used usually as an umbrella concept for a number of religio philosophical currents uh, that are typically seen as alternative and so on. Uh, when I did that, this, they were basically taking over the invented tradition of the occultists and using esotericism to study those uh, kinds of currents. So one would be interested in Gnosticism, in Hermetism, in theurgy, uh, but also in medieval ceremonial magic and Kabbalah, Jewish and Christian Kabbalah. Parcelsianism, Rosicrucianism, all of those things up until sort of spiritualism and occultism and so on and so forth. Um, so, but scholars then have had to spend a lot of time kind of trying to disentangle these connections also. And so um, we would, wouldn't kind of assume that all of these currents are actually connected by a chain of, of, uh, of an actual tradition. Um, so, but it, it, the starting point is still this kind of idea, this, uh, some call it, call it a mnemo-historical construct, and the idea of, you know, how people have been in, uh, inventing and remembering the past, uh, but using that as an optic to look at uh, currents in the past that um, um, also have this sort of difficult-to-place uh, position today, even though they might have been quite common or even uh, influential in their own time. Um, so, uh, but maybe I should say also something about, because now basically I've just been tracing how uh, kind of the scope of esotericism came to be uh, what it is, um, but uh, how then would we define it? What are its characteristics? Uh, so maybe I can use that to talk a little bit about knowledge as well, because when you look at um, attempts to define what esotericism is all about in terms of, you know, what characterizes it, uh, there is usually uh, a focus on some kind of special knowledge. But knowledge is at the center of it. So you have lots of different kinds of definitions, but it's always about knowledge in some way. So usually, uh, you know, uh, we can talk about higher knowledge, uh, 
uh, the, yeah, um, the initiations, uh, knowledge about the hidden side of nature or the hidden aspects of humanity uh, or um, about the soul and these kinds of things. Uh, but um, yeah, so uh, some, some of the definitions have also focused on special ways of uh, uh, building knowledge or, or gaining knowledge. So one of the early definitions by uh, Antoine Febvre, a French scholar, um, emphasized, for example, that um, esotericism is characterized by the doctrine of correspondences, the idea that uh, the world is permeated by secret uh, links that are meaningful, that are uh, significant, and so not causal links, but uh, you know, chains of, of meaning that you can read. So the simplest thing being like uh, the, the macrocosm corresponds to the microcosm, uh, but yeah, and the, the planets uh, have correspondences to things on Earth, uh, the metals, uh, but also parts of the human body, which can then be read to, to get uh, knowledge, uh, but also to uh, predict the future or to do medical uh, interventions uh, in a magical way, that sort of thing. Um, so that's already saying something about how knowledge would be constructed in terms of meaning rather than uh, cause and effect kind of relationships. Um, but another aspect that, that Fever took up already, which I think is important, is uh, that he focused on the imagination. Uh, the idea that um, the human imagination is seen not, you know, just as, um, you know, something that produces fantasy or, you know, uh, uh, yeah, fictions, uh, that kind of thing, but that is an, um, an organ of the soul, uh, an epistemic organ that can help us gain real knowledge about stuff, especially higher roles, uh, that kind of thing. And also that through imagination, um, people can get into contact with uh, intermediary beings, uh, you know, angels or uh, other kinds of spirits, uh, gods maybe also. But uh, the focus on the active imagination as a route to building knowledge is, is central. There was one other aspect I wanted to, to take up actually when we're still talking about this because um, it also has to do with knowledge, but in a more social way. Um, because in the more, more recently in the last, say, uh, 10 years or so, last decade, uh, there's been more of a focus on esotericism as a kind of uh, rejected knowledge. So what, uh, and this relates, of course, to the, to the history of the term as well, that what we see as esotericism is stuff that has been rejected by, you know, the uh, establishment in uh, how we write history or how we write uh, the history of religion or the history of science and so on. And so alchemy isn't really part of that and so on. Uh, so a rejection process. But um, a part of this has also been uh, that um, esotericists, uh, quote unquote, or occultists also today um, would have a kind of a, a perceived opposition also uh, today um, towards what is considered to be establishment knowledge. So whether that is in the field of religion or in science or in politics or in medicine. So this what kind of countercultural aspects <laughs> of knowledge as well as it's going against uh, what the authorities tell you. Um, is, is another aspect. This is more of a social way of how, you know, knowledge uh, uh, is viewed in, in this. Um, so, um, yeah, but I noticed there was one term I didn't mention yet, and that's the one that you wanted me to talk about, namely Gnosis. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it's part of also. the title of the series, so I think we, we owe an explanation here. <laughs> Precisely. And Gnosis is uh, and has been a central term also in both the study of esotericism and in esoteric currents or practices uh, in themselves. And uh, again, of course, squarely related to knowledge and special ways of looking at knowledge. And in the study of esotericism, the term Gnosis is frequently used to denote kind of an approach to knowledge that um, that is um, well unmediated uh, direct transcendent you know ineffable knowledge this idea of kind of just getting illuminated by this and you can't really express it in words you have to experience it for yourself to get it um, and also that it has some kind of salvific uh, characteristic that it, it will also either develop the soul or help you kind of ascend to, to a higher realm or to uh, somehow, you know, being connected to um, to salvation, um, and that you can get this by your own initiative. That's the big thing in terms of um, being, you know, seen as heterodox as well, right? Because uh, in terms of church theology, uh, you can only be saved by grace. Uh, but here, the idea is that you can take your own initiative to gain this knowledge, be illuminated, and then um, ascend or whatever. Uh, so. 
so this is definitely a, a central um, uh, point, but um, I would say that um, one, one problem with the way that scholars of esotericism have been focusing on gnosis is that it maybe overemphasizes precisely this idea of the ineffable and the uh, this kind of radical uh, kind of experience that can't be expressed in words uh, uh, and so on, and you know, connected today maybe to altered states of consciousness and that kind of stuff. Uh, because often what we see, I think, is more connected to what uh, Feyre was talking about with, with imagination, that the, the experiential part also of knowledge is actually highly empirical, uh, connected to the senses, connected to imagery and language that you can write, you know, long uh, descriptions of what you saw. I mean, it can be bizarre, but it can be put into language and, you know, full of symbols and stuff that can be decoded afterwards. So that's a little bit different from, from the way that Gnosis in a more kind of pure sense has been constructed, at least in terms of uh, a special approach to knowledge, uh, emphasizing the unmediated direct access uh, to, uh, to this stuff. Thank you very much. I think this is a very, very important point. And thank you for this, you know, very thorough explanation of what esotericism is, for giving us an historical perspective. But as you know, I'm an anthropologist who works on the contemporary. So um, when you were talking about, you know, the tensions between, you know, uh, what's hidden, what's revealed, I can't help myself thinking about conspiracy theories today. And, and so what is the role? Well, the relationship in the past and possibly in the present between esotericism and conspiracy theories, according to you. Um, and if you have some examples, I know you worked on that. I work a little bit of that as well. So yeah. I'd like to- You wrote a beautiful more. article on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, thanks for that question. So yeah, conspiracy theories and esotericism is something I've been dipping into and published a bit on over the last few years. Um, I think the first thing that should be mentioned is that it's a complicated relationship. Uh, and I would like to kind of start by emphasizing that very often esoteric currents have been kind of the the uh, the objects of conspiracy narratives. You know, they've been on the receiving end. They have been theorized as conspiracies. What do you think of as uh, the Illuminati, uh, the uh, the Golden Dawn, the Ordo Templi Orientis, uh, Satanism? Uh, you know, uh, pagans also, right? Um, so, uh, so whether, you know, conspiracy theories have, have kind of imagined pretty like imaginary <laughs> versions of esoteric societies that may not exist at all, or perhaps exist, but in a very different way from what uh, the conspiracy theories uh, um, claim that they, they do and are capable of. Um, this has actually had also negative repercussion, repercussions for actual living people who are working with esoteric uh, groups. So I would like to start by saying that, um, um, because um, what I want to say in addition to that is that there are also more intimate connections uh, between uh, esotericism and the kind of alternative spiritualities more, more generally perhaps and conspiracy theories. And um, one way to think about this is that on the one hand you have sort of um, full-blown uh, conspiratorial worldviews uh, with a heavy dose of, of um, esoteric spirituality into them, uh, what is now usually being discussed under the term uh, conspirituality. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, so that's on the one hand you've got that, uh, but on the other hand you also have this more sort of general, um, what should you say, like um, general attraction within certain alternative spiritual and esoteric uh, currents of uh, adopting uh, various uh, conspiracy narratives that uh, come their way. You know, it can be 5G this day, it can be a vaccination the other day, it can be, uh, you know, uh, the, the election was stolen the next day. Uh, but, you know, so, so, so these are two kind of things that are related, I think, but needs to be, to be separated analytically. Um, but if we start with this uh, term, conspirituality, which was coined uh, pretty exactly 10 years ago by uh, the uh, sociologists of religion, uh, David Bowes and, and uh, Charlotte Ward, um, the idea there is to, to kind of catch this uh, confluence that we seem to see between uh, kind of new age spiritualities and, conspir and, and conspiracy uh, theories, uh, which um, most people who talk about conspirituality have conceived of this as something novel, something new that's related to the internet age, perhaps, uh, and also that uh, that is a surprising phenomenon, you know, because 
isn't new age supposed to be all uh, love and then peace and uh, femininely coded uh, sort of uh, values? And isn't conspiracy theories to be this uh, hard right wing weapon uh, gun toting kind of uh, uh, thing? And so how could these milieus find together? Well, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. Um, but if you start just by, with the first point about, you know, it being a novel thing, um, so I, I, I don't think it's, it's uh, new and I don't think it's surprising either. But um, to get to why it's not new is that we have lots of earlier examples of um, conspiracy theories being uh, articulated in these occultist esoteric milieus, at least from uh, the, eight, the 19th century and, and forwards. So um, you can think about, um, so within the Theosophical Society, and the Theosophists, for example, were fond of, of seeing uh, Jesuits as being behind uh, all sorts of things that they didn't like, uh, and uh, including also competitors, actually. Other occultists were running the errands of the Jesuits. Uh, Rudolf Steiner, the founder of Anthroposophy, uh, would talk about uh, people being agents of Arima, um and would connect this, among other things, to vaccines. Um, and I, quite recently, I came across this that you know when when the smallpox vaccines were rolled out in Britain in the in the nineteenth century and were made mandatory as well, uh, some well a, a group of people that were central in staging sort of the anti-vaccination campaign uh, back then were Swedenborgians, so members of the kind of Swedenborgian community, uh, and they were also. Um, building up their case against vaccines, partially on spiritual grounds, but also talking about uh, a conspiracy of doctors and government and vaccine producers that are only in it for the money. Sounds familiar. Uh, and also promoting alternative health advice. Uh, you know, that uh, you should just, and they were dismissing the germ theory of, of, um, of disease also as a part of this. So quite a lot of sort of interesting synergies with things that we have seen more recently, but it's kind of always been there. Um, and then there's lots of other things you could talk about as well, of course. Uh, um, so, so, so that's it's clearly not a new phenomenon in that sense. Um, and um, but if you if you then get to to this um, conspirituality theme uh, again, I mean, of, of uh, as a full blown kind of system and examples of that. I mean, the, the typical examples that uh, we've been mentioned about this are. Well, most famous, uh, the British uh, author David Icke, uh, you know, the former um, goalkeeper for the soccer team, uh, was it Coventry, I think he played for, uh, before he became a journalist and then a spokesperson for the Green Party and then discovered spirituality and then developed these uh, conspiracy theories gradually uh, also over time that came to, to have this idea that, um, uh, you know, we are controlled by basically reptiles from outer space that are also satanists and they're shape shapeshifters and they uh they are our leaders and business leaders and religious leaders and so on they are uh, shape-shifting uh reptiles um but uh, another example that's maybe interesting right now is um uh, david wilcock um who um, is also a name that's been in the sort of yeah New Age scene for for a long time, uh, been claiming that he's a reincarnation of Edgar Casey, the Sleeping Prophet, and uh, you know had lots of clairvoyant dreams and, and kind of messages, uh, mediumistic messages, that sort of thing. Um, got into UFO cover up conspiracy theories, uh, more recently uh, during uh, 2020, so during last year, uh, the first part of the pandemic, he uh, seemed to embrace uh, QAnon conspiracy theories and uh, actually had his own kind of spin on that saying that he himself had a separate insider uh, in in the White House uh, that was giving him messages about how the deep state is going to be to be combated uh, by Trump and we're going to have a the lockdown is going to lead to this uh, this kind of uh, rooting out of the uh, yeah sex trafficking uh, uh, pedophile ring and all that stuff as well so you do yeah, have these um, examples, yeah, sorry, yeah. No, no, yeah, of course, we all mm. think about QAnon when we think about mm. conspiracy theories today, and in particular conspiracy theories in politics, right? Um, so, I don't know, what do you think are the possible relationship between esotericism and politics before moving maybe to an analysis of, you know, what do you think about QAnon and what you wrote actually about it? Yeah, uh, well, so yeah, going to politics um, right away. So yeah, uh, 
Well, there too, you have to say that it's it's a complicated relationship, right? So again, you know, in a one-liner, esotericism doesn't have a single political color. You know, it's not red or blue. Uh, it's not right or left. Uh, it can be all these things. But again, since esotericism is an umbrella uh, concept that that covers so many different kinds of groups and currents, uh, it would be strange to think that everybody ended up with the same kind of politics. Um, and it's always kind of been this way. Um, you have, uh, you know, you have different currents uh, that slant in different directions. Uh, I think one thing that has been striking over the last five years or so, uh, just to start from today, um, has been that, you know, esoteric milieus have been susceptible to the very same kind of polarization of politics and society that you see more generally. So I've been looking at some esoteric yeah, movements uh, such as um, Thelema, for example, the religion uh, that was um, established by, by Alistair Crowley uh, in the early 20th century, um, associated with the Order of Templi Orientis and so on. Uh, so in this, in this um, uh, community, uh, there's also been, you know, at, at times you've been wondering if, if the whole uh, religion is going to split into some kind of schism uh, on following basically political partisan lines because uh, you know you see such a strong polarization uh, which is basically trickling down uh, directly from uh, from national politics uh, and then but then also leading to interpretations of uh, of the religion in terms of this and trying to look for ways to legitimize your policy, politics in terms of uh, your religion. This is no different from other religions, so of course. Um, but so, but yeah, it's, it's been an interesting thing to, to watch, um, although sad, <laughs> of course. Um, when it comes, to, I think you asked if it differs from the past. Uh, now, this polarization thing is, of course, um, something characteristic for, of our age in, in some way. Um, but I think it's important to, to note that esotericism has often had. Um, various political connections right off from the start, at least if you say from the start, meaning uh, occultism in the 19th century, as I kind of explained earlier, because those French occultists that first started using the term esotericism and also occultism, uh, they sprung out of a utopian socialist milieu. Uh, so socialism, as I'm talking now pre-Marx, so at the time when socialism was very much Christian, very much religiously oriented, um, was wedded with religion. They wanted to see a union of religion and science, and they wanted to build a new society that's also built, built on tradition and hierarchy and harmony. Uh, so you have this kind of connection. And, and so that's that's a also radically political uh, movement in which um, much of the, well, the early occultism came out of. And then, of course, it's branched off in many different directions. But uh, if you return to the theosophists again, for example, I mean, they uh, are known to have also been connected with things like uh, the workers' rights movements, uh, with uh, feminism, with anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism, kind of home rule in, in India and in, in Ireland as well. Uh, but then also theosophy is kind of split off into ariosophy and esoteric racism and Nazi occultism. So, you know, it can go in many different directions uh, with this stuff. No, I understand. Uh, and you mentioned briefly, it's not a right or left movement. And uh, the thing I immediately think about, at least uh, I work in Southern Europe, so I think about populism. Often, often it is said that populism is something that is beyond left and right, um, and that therefore a kind of more difficult to study in many ways. What do you think, if there is any, about the relationship between populism instead and, and specifically mm -hmm. and esotericism? Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question, I think. Um, and um, well, so, you know, again, the, 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 the connection that you can see, I think, is uh, sort of, again, sort of despite its um, kind of elitist uh, pretensions of, of esotericism, after all, I mean, knowledge for an elect group or whatever, and the secrets and so on. Uh, despite that, there are some characteristics with populism that are shared, and I would see that more in precisely this kind of opposition to establishment knowledge and kind of bringing out alternatives, uh, this more kind of individualistic epistemology of it as well, maybe, uh, you know, that uh, the, the, you shouldn't find, you shouldn't just take what is given to you in terms of knowledge, you should uh, do what is right for you, and you should believe in what is right for you, and truth is an intuitive concept, and you know, that kind of stuff which can have some connections to uh, populist uh, rhetoric. But 
But at the same time, though, I think that um, uh, at least many forms of esotericism are also um, uh, elitist in a more decidedly non-populist way. So in the sense that it's not just the uh, establishment that's wrong. It's also, uh, you know, wanting to take a stance against the mainstream. And so if you think about populism defined as, uh, you know, um, somebody claiming to be speaking for the people, for the masses, then that's, you know, not necessarily the, the normal thing to see in, in esoteric terms. But of course, I mean, it's, it's a complicated relationship. And uh, um, maybe this is, again, something, you know, getting back to conspiracy theories that when you have conspiracy theories in esoteric milieus that are also very much connected to populism, then that can become a bridge uh, between these kinds of milieus and something to, to rally around actually, you know, some kind of common enemy. So I think that's something we have seen uh, actually. Thank you very much. I have to admit this was a bit of a self-centered question because this will be my next research on populism and magic in Europe. So I wanted to uh, hear your take on it. So yeah. I apologize with the public, but <laughs> um, <Great. clears throat> I have some questions, sorry, from my students, actually. We read your 2020 article uh, on over religio titled The Magic Theory of politics, memes, magic, and the enchantment of social forces in the American magic war. Mm -hmm. We read it in the class of magic I'm teaching. We loved it. Um, and we all found it useful to understand, to better understand our, COVID, our current political situation. Do you think it's still relevant today? And you, if you can summarize a little bit what you were saying, you know, and if you have thoughts on it. Then yeah, I have some specific questions actually from my students um that you know let's start from this exactly well so great well i'm happy that you found something of interest and relevance in it as you said i mean uh, it was written well it, it came out last year but it was actually written back in 2017 so it's uh you know this is what can happen with publication lag <laughs> also uh so a lot has happened since then i mean the article was trying to well it was describing a situation that emerged in the wake of uh and also the build-up uh towards trump's election uh, in 2016, um, and so in many ways, it's it's already dated because also these 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 things have, have changed um, afterwards. But uh, but what I was looking at specifically was that uh, you had this magic war uh, that erupted uh, between basically pro and anti-Trump occultists and occult-inclined activists, you could say, on both these sides of the spectrum um, that were trying to either boost uh, Trump. Uh, or to to uh, to hinder him to uh, to kind of um, topple him in some way through magical means um, in various ways through rituals uh, through sigils but sigils then also used uh, through memes um, and that sort of stuff so I was interested in analyzing how how this this magic war uh, developed you know how the the belligerent so to say uh, viewed also magical efficacy in in this political context. And also how this was connected to their political uh, activism in a more sort of normal uh, sense. Uh, but on a deeper level, I was also interested in how, um, well, and, and why also, I think, why the occult uh, can become a, a political resource uh, in certain uh, contexts as it was here. Uh, so under what circumstances and, and uh, you know, how can we try and explain this? I was trying to, to look at this, uh, uh, this, these questions and, and searching my way forward there a little bit. Um, I highly recommend it to the public here. Um, I think it's very useful. So some of the students are asking how the groups you are mentioning in this article view the efficacy of the magical rights on the political terrain. Mm. Yeah, so um, the short answer to begin with is that uh, it also differs a bit from group to group and also I think from individual to individual. Um, but so to, to kind of recapitulate a little, a little bit maybe, I was looking at three kind of movements in this uh, that aren't really social movements in that sense, but uh, maybe movements in a more temporal sense, <laughs> one following on the other. So one of them was what I called uh, the cult of Keck, uh, which was a sort of a, a religionization, a kind of a magical, uh, slightly jocular uh, religion that was uh, developing from uh, image board culture, you know, so uh, Chan, Chan culture, 4chan, 8chan, um, around the uh, Pepe the Frog 
uh, meme that was being understood as um, related to the Egyptian uh, god Kek, uh, which is sometimes in iconography seen as a frog uh, and connected with chaos and darkness and all that stuff. And then a Trump was somehow an avatar of, or at least anointed by, by this Kek. Uh, and in this context, you, you got the, um, the idea of meme magic that by spreading memes, uh, you can influence real world events uh, not just through kind of reaching people and influencing their behaviors, but we're also uh, certain texts that were circulating that were describing this in terms of occult context, uh, concepts such as uh, sigils, sigil magic, uh, but also uh, thought forms that, you know, if uh, enough people think about the same thing or get exposed for the same kind of stimuli, then it will create like um, um, a thought that exists on the astral plane or something like that, and it can in its turn have an effect on the world. Uh, so this is a kind of a mind over matter type of, uh, of uh, magical um, thinking involved. And of course, the problem with that sort of material, though, coming out of this uh, 4chan HM context is that, you know, how serious is this, right? Uh, it's a milieu that's very much um, building on, well, jokes, uh, irony, and so forth, but also at the same time being extremely serious through through this. So, uh, so also in, in my material on this cult of Kek that they talked about, you know, uh, the cult of Kek being a post-ironic <laughs> religion, you know, so when the jokes uh, have been done so many times that it's actually real, right? So I think that's also happening a little bit with the, the way that magic was being discovered in, in this kind of context and used and that this, this theories of, on efficacy were were uh, really discussed in, in that context as you know it can have this uh, sort of effect. Then in the in the magic resistance, which was the other uh, another group that I looked at, uh, which I think is better known maybe also. So this is um, you know this this whole uh, rituals to bind uh, Donald Trump and all those who abet him stuff, right? That uh, originally was was uh, published as a blog post by Michael Hughes, um, occult writer. And then went right viral, was picked up by uh, media and then on social media and lots of people were kind of joining in here to perform synchronized rituals uh, at every waning crescent moon at midnight to, um, uh, well, against Trump and, and, uh, and, and his supporters um, until he is driven from office. And in that context, uh, an interesting thing in terms of efficacy is that um, uh, at least Michael Hughes himself kind of uh, has been reasoning along the lines of, uh, you know, whether or not magic works in the magical sense of the word uh, doesn't really matter because this kind of ritual will have an effect uh, on the social level anyway, as galvanizing uh, people of like mind and uh, creating attention to the cause and sort of, um, yeah, building a protest movement. But there's still this opening the door to that, you know, there might be something else. And you see that in other segments, you know, that um, also in some, uh, some criticism of the, the ritual from uh, uh, pagan circles as well, that, you know, is it so wise to, to, to share this kind of ritual that also invokes uh, spiritual entities and sharing this with people who have no, um, no experience in doing magic from before? They could mess with some serious, uh, seriously dangerous stuff. We shouldn't be doing this. So... You, you clearly did have those kind of uh, ideas of um, magical efficacy in terms of spirits uh, intervening also. Um, and with the, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no. Yeah, and then, so, yeah so, so this is now sort of the final thing because, so the cult of the magic resistance, um, which of course have, happened after the inauguration of Donald Trump, uh, but then there was a magical reaction to the magic resistance as well, which came from more hardcore occultist milieus as well. I mean, well, actually a very small group of people uh, who started this uh, coming out of a golden dawn uh, ritual magical uh, context had been Trump supporters for a while before, but we're genuinely worried about this um, magic resistance business, uh, you know, and genuinely wor worried that the witches are trying to, and that, that they might succeed in toppling you know, this uh, legitimately elected president with uh, spells and demons and so forth. Uh, and so we have to stop this by doing counter spells and uh, getting also um, other kinds of people involved, like uh, positive thinkers or evangelicals and people on the Christian right that can do prayer meetings and so on to stop, to stop this, uh, this magical uh, current. So they really 
uh, took the efficacy seriously and uh, took appropriate kind of occult measures to try and stop that and try to build this broad coalition as well, which was interesting. Um, I just wanted to add that this, I think, is a prime example of how complicated is the relationship with esotericism and politics today. Um, I have another question for my students. <clears throat> Are there any alliances between magical right and Christian right? If there are, is there anything we can learn about the malleability of conservative American Christian practice and the ongoing traditional, but more often in marginalized spaces of the infusion of Christian and magical practice? Hmm. Yeah, well, so um, again, I mean, so what I just talked about actually, you know, this um, uh, the, the mag magical, um, uh, reaction business that that was an actual attempt to create such a connection between uh, the Christian right and uh, and occultist milieu in times in terms of defending um, uh, Trump uh, against the witches. Uh, but I'm, I'm not so sure how successful uh, that was actually. I, I, I must say though, I have not been following this in any detail. But I'm not aware of like any clear kind of connections between uh, explicit sort of occultists uh, and ritual magicians working. Uh, concerted together with uh, with Christians in that sense. Um, I don't think it's very big in any case. It's, it's also a very difficult thing to do for, for the Christian right because of all the demonization of magic. So it's a very tricky boundary to pull down. And so it seems to me, again, I'm getting back to conspiracy theories again, that actually what's happened after, uh, long after I wrote this, well, actually around the time that I wrote this article, um, uh, that uh, with the rise of uh, um, the QAnon movement, um, that here you get a much kind of an easier bridge between occult milieus and the Christian right. And sort of the QAnon movement has in part uh, taken over the kind of thing that, uh, that um, you know, the Pepe de Frog uh, cult of Keck movement was doing before. And there might be some of the same demography that's going into that, but it's clearly also reaching out to a whole different crowd. Uh, and you've got also kind of uh, Christian online uh, churches uh, devoted to QAnon and kind of interpreting Q drops uh, through uh, the book of revelations and, uh, and vice versa and that kind of stuff. And, and here you do have get connections. Um, uh, I mean, also when you can see at uh, what happened at Capitol Hill, uh, what kind of what kinds of people can manifest on the same streets, you know, which bodies uh, come together um, and it seems to me that conspiracy theories were a lot more efficient for making those bridges between uh, communities that have difficulties of finding together along uh, something else than, than this common adversary, uh, fictive, <laughs> fictive uh, common ad adversary. Um, so yeah, those are my um, five cents, but... Um, um, no, I think... I think you um, just pointed out how the situation is changing uh, very rapidly, much more rapidly probably than how the publishing times, let's say, of what we write and study. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, since it's, you know, how we have 10 minutes left, more or less, um, what you're currently, currently working on, where do you see this type of research like on esotericism and pol politics going? And um, is there any topic that you would encourage students to do their interest in this kind of topics to do their research on? Right. Well, I think there's a lot of, uh, I'd be curious to hear what, uh, what your students will be picking up next, actually, after reading your, your course uh, on this. Um, uh, well, so what, what I'm doing at the moment, so I'm, I'm finishing up a lot of older projects. That's one thing I'm doing, uh, which includes, uh, you know, co-editing co yet another book on conspiracy theories and religion, uh, where we do also have um, one article uh, on the QAnon uh, movement as well, which I'm very happy that we'll get in. I hope we can publish this soon before it's all passe again, <laughs> uh, uh, so on. And I'm also, I'm also, um, editing, this is a very long-term project, a dictionary on contemporary esotericism, which is also a bit of a, um, let's say, you know, it's a paradoxical thing almost to do, to, to write a, a handbook or a dictionary on something contemporary because it moves and changes all the time. Uh, but I'm trying at least to, to uh, with a team of uh, very competent uh, authors to get something out there. 
Um, but also, um, so I've recently uh, received some funding for a new uh, project that I will start uh, next year. Uh, it's a historical project that will go in quite a different direction, actually, uh, for me at least. And I, I will be looking at the ways in which uh, the uh, the Romani people has been associated with uh, magic in European history. Um, and so there's various aspects to this, but this is more now also, uh, so one focus is more on, on how uh, you know, this well-known use of, of discourses on magic uh, as exclusionary practices, how, how that was central to constructing the Roma as, as ra radically other, and, um, you know, whether by demonizing them that, you know, they're in league with, with demons and, and so on, or exoticizing them that, uh, you know, they're enchanted uh, people uh, and so on, or also casting them as, as frauds, which you also get later on, right? So we know this dynamic from European entanglement, uh, sorry, uh, engagements uh, with uh, non-European peoples in the colonial uh, context, uh, right? Uh, but we have this little studied and long running example in Europe, so at home, so to say, that's uh, not really been looked at. So that's, that's what I'm gonna do. Um, and then also try to get into, you know, how some of the practices that were singled out as magical and dangerous, uh, how they, uh, what kind of meaning they actually carried, you know, so uh, how they offered means of economic sustenance uh, for largely itinerant groups and so on, uh, but also as means of constant cultural contact uh, in the, the kind of the, the magical economy of Europe at the time, right? Because uh, this, this is this idea that, you know, the Roma were accused of spreading superstition, but really they were, you know, to the extent that they were engaging with uh, what would be considered magic, it was servicing a demand that was uh, there, you know, in the European population, craving, <laughs> craving magic, and playing the role that was kind of described there. So, um, so this is, uh, yeah. So there are issues of, of race and of class, uh, but also of gender uh, come into this project, featured quite uh, heavily, um, and uh, and so on. So that's it. Will be an exciting. Um, uh, project to get started on. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, forward to it. Um, and me too to read it. Actually, I think it looks it looks great and 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 so very important in many in many ways. Yeah, and so, so that maybe too because I think you also asked about what uh, you know what kind of research I would like to see more of. You know, in in general in this kind of area of esotericism and politics and and so on. And I think actually that is, this is maybe also part of the reason why I came up with this project, you know, that uh, intersectional perspectives are really, really important to, to do more of. Because so, you know, for a long time now, you know, we have been doing, uh, paying attention to gender issues and, and, and sexuality and gender um, and race uh, is starting to pick up some speed as well. It's taken way too long to, to kind of critically interrogate uh, uh, race and colonialism in the study of esotericism, but it's coming along now. But the, the dimension of class, uh, that's something that's been almost entirely unexplored in the study of esotericism. And I think there's a lot to get there, and especially in this kind of intersectional uh, connection with uh, race and ethnicity and, and, uh, and gender. Um, so uh, I think that is something actually that could also help us complicate some of the old binaries between folk and learned magic, for example, um, but also things like, um, uh, yeah, the idea of uh, establishment institutions against esoteric rejected knowledge. What does that mean when the esotericists are actually aristocr uh, aristocrats? Uh, you know, you have nothing to lose. <laughs> you know, is that so? Uh, mainstream versus alternative, and other of those uh, dichotomies or, or binaries that I think we need to to complicate. And so, an intersectional perspective on on these issues, I think, would be very helpful. And that would, of course, connect up to to politics in many many different ways as well. Is this one of the reasons why we recently um, hear more <clears throat> scholars talking about esotericism rather than Western esotericism, for example? Is this the attempt to, you know, make it more intersectional part of this movement? It, it's, it's related, I think, yeah. It's, uh, it's a part of it, um, though, I mean, the, the arguments for dropping the Western, or at least, you know, making that slide into the background uh, are multiple. There's many ways in which you can argue that point. Um, 
but it's definitely a part of it uh, that we need to interrogate sort of the uh, the colonial history of, uh, of esotericism and how the term has been and also this the practices associated with it have been connected in this colonial setting where also so again i mean i've been mentioning the theosophical society a few times today but uh, how their uh, cent central ideas and practices were shaped in india and also by indians that have been tended to be written out of the history only to focus on the the white the white people who were there <laughs> right so you've got these kinds of things uh, um, these kinds of aspects and the the um, suspicions perhaps that uh, the w in w e doesn't stand only for western but also for white uh, right so the, yeah there's, a, there's there's definitely an aspect uh, to uh, something to that uh, that aspect as well Thank you for clarifying this. And if I can add my own two cents on, you know, perspectives that students could take in the study of this type of to topic, I think, I don't know about your um, opinion of that, but I think we need more ethnographies. We yeah. need more anthropologists doing uh, this. Um, what do you think? Absolutely. Uh, I think I've written an article on that too, actually, somewhere. Uh, with Susanna, I think. Probably, with Susanna, right? Exactly, with Susanna uh, Crockford, exactly. So no, definitely. I mean, uh, interdisciplinarity, uh, the social sciences have been a huge, I mean, I'm working a lot with that sort of stuff as well. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, if you're going to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to broaden our understanding of especially contemporary esoterism and how it's lived uh, today and, and you know, the, the, the negotiations and the, 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 uh, the changes from context to context, then of course you need uh, um, anthropology and ethnography and sociology and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So I encourage all the students to think about this. Um, and I have a bit of a personal question. I don't know if you want to answer. If you don't, never mind. Which is <laughs> the um, uh, within your own research, mm -hmm. which is the topic, research, article, book, whatever, that you are more, most proud of? Oh, wow. Huh. Yeah, most proud of. I, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of, um, I, I can be kind of, um, um, how do you say, like uh, restless in, in my research a little bit. You know, I finish something and move on to the next thing, and then I get sort of a bit, uh, yeah. Um, we all enjoy this, actually, yeah. as readers, so <laughs> it's not a problem for us. <laughs> I, should... I get a bit stressed when people want me to come back and talk about what I did, you know. A couple of years ago, which or, or maybe just last week, but was actually the result of something. I, I want to move on to something else. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, what am I most uh, proud of? I mean, yeah, I, 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 I actually honestly don't know how to. Okay, to, that's uh, that's okay. That's okay. It was a you know more personal question, but I just wanted to um, add, the, add um, for the audience another <clears throat> dimension to of your work that we didn't quote is the, your uh, engagement with. Uh, cognitive sciences and the study cognitive oh. science of religion. Hmm. I don't know if you we have you know two minutes, but if you want to say something about this um, aspect of your work, I think it's an important you know addition to what we um, already just mentioned. Yeah, exactly. No, it is uh, something I've been uh, doing, trying to find ways in which we can bridge between kind of historical and also ethnographic studies of esotericism and. The emerging cognitive sciences of religion. Um, there's a lot to be said about it, but one aspect that I've been looking most at is uh, to, to give us some more tools for working with um, uh, experience, the experiential uh, dimension, and again, connecting back to imagination. As uh, you know, I talked a bit about earlier, that I think the imagination is very central to, to um, these practices that are related to knowledge uh, knowledge producing of this kind of special way you know visionary or auditory or kind of experiences in which you get knowledge of higher worlds and uh so i've written a couple of uh, uh things on that and um think that we have a framework uh, emerging in uh, in parts of the actually the cognitive neuroscience of perception that can help us understand how you can cultivate the imagination that imagination is a skill that uh, takes uh, training and learning over time and also has material dimensions to it, uh, um, which uh, can be utilized in, uh, in practices that must be lived over time to, to kind of basically remold and reshape your, uh, your experience of the world and of your own inner life. And that's, this is something that we see in um, a lot of esoteric practices and we can understand this with some of the tools from cognitive science. 
So many thanks, really. I think it's time to wrap up uh, now. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Asprem, for your participation and wonderful conversation. It was very informative and very pleasant. Um, so, and thank you all for having been with us. Uh, please stay tuned on the activities of the CSWR, of the Transcendence and Transformation Initiative and of Nosiologies for the next semester. You can find all this information on the CSWR website. Um, and thanks again, you all, and have a lovely rest of your day and holiday season. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Sponsor, Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2021, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.